Good morning. I shared with you not too long ago that I'm kind of, uh, I've become a little bit addicted to reels on social media. Uh, it's a little bit of a problem. I don't care about the rest of the stuff. I get on videos and I love watching car accidents and stuff like that. Does anybody else that does that? That's really embarrassing. But I'm just confessing. Confession's good. So um, just letting you know. I mean, like even like beatdowns, like there's fights and stuff that's really bad. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not advocating violence, but it's fun to watch on video. I don't know why. It's, I feel bad for saying that. But I mean, when you're walking through there and you're like, wow, that was terrible. Let me watch it again. You know, you do that. it's terrible. But so I think that we live in the culture to where here's what happens, man. It's so weird, man. So I could be totally like hurting, fall in like the, the subway, what do you call that? Tracks and trapped. And instead of like going, hey, let me help you out. We'd be all like, hey, let me video this, you know, because uh, we might get a reel. Uh, and, you know, you've, you've seen people in attacks and, and, and people in accidents. And it's like the first thing people do now, it's so messed up, is they pull out their phone and they want to witness the tragedy and have it to share with others. It's like we almost glory in the pain. We glory in the tragedy of others. And uh, so I'm going I'm to open with this. Uh, the reason I'm going to share with you what I'm sharing with you today is because I'm not glorying in the tragedy. I don't, I don't want to feel like there are, there are people living in um, a situation and a context that is bad. It's not only not good, it's like destructive and detrimental for them. And me just pull out a phone and video it. That, that is not what a loving pastor would do. And so I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. I'm going to really ask you, if you don't know me, give me grace today because you don't know me. And if I didn't know me and I didn't agree with some things I'm going to share with you, I, I'd be like really mad. But I promise you, this is my heart. I love you. I don't care who you are, like what your background is, even what your current situation is. Nothing that I'm going to say today means I don't love you and that I don't care about you. And I don't want anything that I say to come across like from a judgmental or super spiritual position because I, of all people, have been forgiven by a gracious God. And I'm not worthy to judge anybody. So... I know you're probably going, oh my word, what are we talking about today? Man, this is going to be heavy. Well, the context of the message is really on marriage. So I want, to, I want to ask you to turn in, turn on your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to talk about some stuff that is not going to be easy for everyone to hear. And I'm asking you to give me 32 minutes, all right? Don't give me 10, and then when you hear something... Check out or walk out. I really am asking you before the Lord, just give me the 32 minutes to speak to you from the word and from my heart. And, uh, and understand, please try the, your best to trust me. I'm giving it to you from a place of love and not from a place of judgment. Um, here's the truth. Marriage is tough. At its best, marriage is hard. Um, and it's imperfect. Nobody has a perfect marriage including me. And the reason it's not perfect is because I'm in it. If it was just Amy, it would be perfect. Wasn't that smart for me to say? Yeah. I know you're like, wow, that guy's okay. So, but here's the deal. I mess it up. I mess it up. And maybe once or twice, she's done stuff to mess it up too. But we're not perfect people. As long as we're not perfect people, we're not going to have a perfect marriage. I will say, even though our marriage is not perfect, she has never one time, I mean, we agreed up front, we're not divorcing, and we don't, it's like the D word, we don't even say the D word, and she's never asked me to leave or told me to leave. I will say, she has pulled the bag out of the closet a few times, all right, but she's never like walked me to the door, and, uh, and marriage is hard, all right, and I, you know, you may not be used to a pastor admitting that, but look, marriage is like oil and water at the best, and it's not going to be easy. But this is the beauty. It's so good, man. I mean, God even says it's very good. In creation, after he made man and woman, he actually like added the very. I mean, like the whole creation became complete and very good after the creation of man and woman. So it's really important that we get it. We don't want good. We don't want bad, certainly. We don't want terrible. 
We really want a very good life and we want very good relationships. And that's why I'm sharing what I'm sharing with you today. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him saying, It is lawful, or is it? Question, is it lawful? to divorce one's wife for any reason. So he's, he's, this, this Pharisee is trying to catch Jesus and trick him, trying to get him to say something, A, that might get him in trouble with the law, like the law of Moses. Uh, other than that, though, he's actually kind of also trying to get many of the people, maybe the masses who are following Jesus, to get mad at him. And this is kind of in a similar way. There are religious people, you could call them right, left, whatever you want to call them, but there's religious people who hate what I'm about to tell you. And they would definitely try to corner us in a position to make you mad at us and push you away from God's plan and purpose and word for your life. And I want to encourage you, just because someone's religious does not mean they love you. Just because someone's religious doesn't mean they have your best interest in mind. We have people in our culture who stand on the right, if you will, maybe the far right, whatever you want to call it, and they just love terrible judgmental condemnation at you. And, and it's not in a position of humility and love. It's in a position of, I got you and I'm better than you. That's not where we are. But we also have an extreme on the other side who basically says, hey, you live your life, we'll live our life. God's okay with you no matter what you do. Both are wrong. We should ask God, God, what do you say? What do you have to say about this issue of marriage? Because we want to hear it because we want what you want. I know that very good is going to come in my life when I'm seeking you, not when I'm seeking me, not when I'm trying to do what feels right, not when I'm trying to do what seems right, what everybody else in the culture is telling me is right. But what does God's word say? Because God is the one who's ultimately in charge. Look at verse 4. Jesus answered, have you not read? It's almost like he's like, have you not read the Bible, man? I mean, have you not heard what God says? Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, the word cleave, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You're going to hear that over and over and over again. So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. We hear that almost at every wedding you attend. What God has joined together, let no man separate. We have no idea. I mean, think about it. It actually comes originally from Genesis 2.24. It's echoed in this passage, Matthew 19.5. But then even again in Ephesians 5, which is like the chapter nobody wants to talk about because it's awkward. And, and a lot of stuff, by the way, we're going to talk about this too. It's very culturally unacceptable. It's like not politically correct and everybody's gonna ooh, and just uh, trust me the most uncomfortable person in the room is me because I'm saying it all right so you know the, I, I understand here's Ephesians 5 though Paul says this whole like the two shall become one but after he says that he says something totally we get he says this is a profound mystery no kidding right it's a it's a profound mystery that a woman will put up with a man for a long time right that's for sure. And then in some cases, let's give grace, a, a, a man will put up with a woman. I mean, they're just literally made different. They're wired different. Um, the men are sometimes uh, less intelligent when it comes to understanding women. Can I, that sounds really insulting. I know for me, I miss it sometimes. I don't understand. I, I do feel like marriage is a complete mystery. And oftentimes, we, we rush to emotional feelings. We rush to maybe the popular... Um, uh, decisions or popular opinions of the day instead of asking God, God, what would you have? This two becoming one that's a profound mystery. Could you help me make it very good? I'm going to talk about two ways really specifically from God's word today that I think we can really learn that. And here's the first. God has a design for marriage. It's a specific design. God has a design for marriage. And if you're single, you may be like, Man, I, this, I'm, I'm not married, so this is irrelevant to me. Well, if you ever hope to be married, it's very important, all right? So take notes. Uh, but I would say even if you don't hope to be married, let's say that you feel like God has literally called you to singleness, and that is absolutely possible. God calls some people to singleness, and it's a very important calling. In fact, 
we're going to talk about. Some people are, are called to singleness simply because of certain temptations in their lives. And, and God actually uh, doesn't remove the temptation in their lives. And so they literally uh, are called to this singleness in, in order to please God. And, and so with that, we're going to understand what we mean by God's design. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And so this should not be a controversial statement, but even reading that verse in our culture, in our society, you can already tell where we're going, and I'm sure some people are already getting uncomfortable because this is being videoed, all right? But it's super important for us not to run away from God's Word and not to be ashamed of what it says, but to communicate it in love. And that's why I started the whole thing trying to tell you how much I love you, because my... my, greatest intention is for you to hear the love of Jesus Christ and not some judgmental spirit today. It should not be a controversial statement to say that God has created humans in the image of God and then he made the man and woman. That's just, that's just scripture, but it's also just common sense. We, we know this to be true. This is logical. It's actually illogical to step outside of that creative order. And so with that, we see God established a clear created order or creation order. And this creation order has a million implications. This is the thing. I'm not going to just get on one subject and, and pick on it today. This really impacts all of us in various ways. And so with that, let's just dive into some of the implications. We're going to talk about three in particular. The first implication of this creation order is uh, an emphasized distinct human value. And here's what we mean by that. God has made you more valuable than any other creature. That's a good thing. It's a really good thing. It means people can't shoot you, <laughs> right? I mean, that was funny too, right? I mean, it's because, you know, people hunt animals. You know what I'm saying? So animals are, are, should be respected. We should not, I don't believe we should abuse animals at all. God created them and, and he created them for a purpose. Scripture's clear about that. But he gave us dominion over the animals. He gave us dominion over the earth. And so with that, humans are given an elevated level of value. This is not, this is not really a debated thing for people who believe the Bible. That's the way God intends it. It's called the Imago Dei. He actually has made us in his image. And because humans are made in the image of God, we have a higher value than any other creature that is around us. How does that apply to marriage? Super important because a lot of men might immediately try, you know, try to start running to Ephesians 5 that we'll visit later. They start pointing to one or two scriptures and they might use that as some kind of support for being a dictatorial jerk to their wife. There is no spiritual excuse for an emotional or verbal or physical abuse of your wife. None. Don't try to use God as an excuse for your evil actions if you're abusive, all right? And look, if you walk out on that, man, that's like, yeah, that's pretty embarrassing. That'd be bad, right? Because you know, when you throw a rock in a pack of dogs and one of them barks, you know who got hit, amen? I'm not saying you're dogs. I'm just making an illustration. I'm trying to help you understand what I'm saying. So, so we understand that we're not talking about that. Here's the thing. Husband and wife, equal value in the creative order in the sense that they're both made in the image of God. So why should a man not or why can a woman not abuse her husband? You may say, well, that never happens. Yes, it does, believe it or not. I mean, there are women who take their man out and by the woodshed, just whoop him, man. It's true, all right? And that's not okay. It's not okay for either of us to be physically, verbally, or emotionally abusive to one another. It's not acceptable. The reason why is because we're both made in the image of God. There's an elevated level of value that's emphasized in Scripture, and this is part of the distinction of the creative order of God. Secondly, there's a, also an established distinct human identity. It's not just about the value of human beings, but there is a very distinct uh, a distinction, a strong distinction in human identity here in the passage and repeated throughout Scripture, male and female. This is inescapable. We can't run from this. As Christians, we don't try to excuse it. We don't, we don't try to explain it away. 
We, we should not be really worried about it. But it's in our culture such a firestorm waiting to happen. But this includes biological designation and spiritual roles in the family. There's no way to escape this. And in, and in our culture, here's the problem. We're so afraid of being unliked. We're so afraid of being unfriended that we actually have, have kind of like, it's almost like that Homer Simpson thing. You ever seen him where he backs into the bushes and it just kind of, you know, we're, we're just like, we leave the conversation that's awkward. We leave the conversation because we're afraid of how people may respond when we speak the truth. And so as a result, no one speaks the truth. And in the absence of truth, we're just walking around with a lot of fallacy. But here's what we understand. Oftentimes, it's what we want to hear the least that we need to hear the most. It's what we want to hear the least that we need to hear the most. And so today, as we talk about God's established order in creation, we're talking about a distinct human value. We're talking about a distinct human identity. And this carries a lot of, a lot of specific application with it. But then thirdly... It expressed a demonstration of human relationship with God. And so because of the creation order, we see that our relationships, in particular relationships with man and woman, husband and wife, are to be a picture of, a snapshot of, a demonstration of our relationship to God. That's just a natural implication that comes from Scripture that will help us understand why it's important that we don't try to redesign or redefine what God intended in the creative order. And so with that, we understand that marriage is an earthly image of His divine plan. Marriage is an earthly snapshot of God's divine plan and order for the world. So God's creative order is not complicated. It's actually kind of easy, but that does not mean we don't manage to mess it up. We all have managed to mess it up. God's expectations of us, oftentimes we neglect, and this is why I can stand confidently and tell you that I'm no better than anyone else regardless. But we often set ourselves up for failure. We try to actually please God on our own terms. We try to be a uh, man or woman of God without actually uh, allowing God to, uh, to define the terms. We want to actually do our own deal. And, and this is a weird illustration, but it's almost football season, so I tried to think of a, a football one. So it's like a wide receiver trying to play with his hands chained behind his back. You know, he could totally dress out. He could look the part. He could actually run the, run the pattern, man. You could, with, the, with your, you know, your hands chained behind your back, you could still run the route. You could, you could do it, but when they throw the ball, unless you got a big mouth, you're not catching it, right? It's not going to happen. Why? Because you're, you're debilitated. you got good intentions maybe, mainly, maybe, but you, you don't have uh, excellent execution. You don't have the ability to execute correctly because you've debilitated yourself by redesigning how your, your, your function. And, so, and somebody could actually stand on the side and say, hey, let me take those chains off your hands. And you could be like, no, nah, I'm good, man. I'm going to run the route. I can do this. I can do it. And that's what it looks like when we do things that depart from God's plan. I'm going to give you two examples that are super uncomfortable. I'm just going to totally be up front with you. They're uncomfortable for me to say. going to be uncomfortable for some people to hear. But I want you to hear them in love, all right? Two examples really show this kind of example where there can be people. I want you to hear this. There can be people who genuinely love Jesus and want to please him. And they express this desire. I have talked to these people, all right? These kinds of people genuinely want to please God with their lives. They desire to follow Jesus and surrender to him. But they somehow have compartmentalized certain parts of their life to where, for example, they live together before they're married. Oh, he just said that. Did you hear what he said? Y'all can, y'all can laugh at that, all right? Because here's the thing. I know it's super awkward. It's super awkward, and it's why nobody wants to talk about it. But just because we do something doesn't mean we shouldn't speak to it. Just because something's difficult for us to hear doesn't mean it's not what we need to hear. And it doesn't mean God's grace isn't sufficient. It doesn't mean that God can't still use us. 
But again, I'm not going to pick up my iPhone and video you for a reel later. I want to tell you the truth and I want to help you. I want to try to help you find God's very good plan for your life. I don't want you to settle for less than God's best. And so that's one example that, that I know is super tough, but it's one that I think is very common in our day. And I'm going to say this because I think it's, it's, it's relevant and it's, again, uh, something that may be um, irrelevant to your specific case. But if we love each other and we're not married, if we love each other and we know for a fact that we're going to spend the rest of our lives together, let me just encourage you to commit. I mean, it's really, that's, I'm just loving you by saying, prove it. You know, prove it. I know it's super normal now. I would say, this is not an exaggeration. I wish it was, but over half, this is why I feel awkward talking about it, over half, maybe three-fourths of the people that I I meet with in premarital counseling are living together. And that may shock you. If it doesn't shock you, it should. Because it's not God's design. It's not God's best. Listen, teenagers, it's not very good. All right? I know that you could, you could do it and you may be like, oh, I'm just going to, it's like a test run. God forbid that's how you look at marriage. Marriage is a bigger deal than a test run. All right? And so the, the thing that I want to lovingly say to you is like, you need to choose great over good. You need to want God's best for your lives. But then there's other categories that are equally awkward, that are tough. I mean, there's times where husbands are abusive and husbands are unfaithful and maybe not adulterous, but they're just not being the man God's called them to be. Maybe you're not being the wife God's called you to be. And then there's other cases where um, same gendered attracted couples come together and, and sometimes they, they get married, gay marriage now in our culture. And you may say, oh man, you're just picking on everybody today. This is going to be terrible. I want you to hear, listen, it doesn't matter how awkward it is. At the end of the day, God's best for you is very good. It's not, it's not just good. And I know sometimes it's really hard to, to embrace What's great? Because it means we have to actually temporarily leave behind something we actually think is what we want more. And, and I think this is something that's um, somewhat debated in, in pastoral circles. So uh, a lot of people would disagree with what I'm going to say. Um, some people would say that it's a sin to even be tempted. And I, I disagree with that. Some people would say, well, Wayne, it's really, it's a sin if you're even, if you have tendencies toward same-sex same attraction. I disagree. I, that's like saying if you're an alcoholic that it's a sin to be uh, drawn to alcohol. Well, that's not true. That's just not true. And so with that, I, I want to say God has a, a plan for all of us. And it may, it may not be the plan we want, but God can actually give you grace and strength to have other plans and ideas and other path that moves you away from something that you may have a tendency to do. And so with that, I know, again, it's so difficult to have the conversation. But with that, we understand maybe the desire of many individuals is super sincere. And they want to please God. And they're like, hey, I can do this and please God. And I would say, look, I, I don't even doubt somebody's sincerity and wanting to love God and please Him and surrender their life to Him and still be in that kind of context. Here's the deal. It's literally trying to catch a ball with your hands chained behind your back. You're not going to find that it's very good in your life. It's not going to be God's design for you. It's not the way God has created you. It is not his best for you. And so as a loving pastor, I just want to encourage you to run toward and to lean into what God has for you. And if you're in your high school years, your middle school years, you may think this is way premature and you're not going to get married for 100 years. And listen, God has a woman. God has a man for you. And it's going to be very good if you keep things in order. If you get things out of order, it will not be as good as it could have been. So my, my encouragement to you is like, choose God's best. Choose God's best because it's so much better than the alternative. So how, how do we live out God's design for marriage? That's 
All of that's the problem. So so what's what's the solution? How do we live out God's plan for marriage? We live out God's plan for marriage by starting today. We actually, wherever we are on the spectrum, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've experienced, no matter how many times we've made a mistake, no matter how many times we've debated with other people, hey, I can go this way or I can go that way. We've got to start where we are. And here's the thing. We don't, we don't start where we are and try to cross the finish line when, when, when the, the gun sounds and we take off, right? This is not a, a sprint. It's literally a marathon. This life that God has called us to, he doesn't expect us to cross the line today. We're in a process, biblical word here, of sanctification, He's making us and shaping us into the men and women that he's called us to be. And so part of this whole thing is recognizing it's a daily dying to self. It's, it's me and you waking up every day and saying, God, no matter what I've done in the past, I want to give you today. No matter what decisions I've made that are not pleasing to you, God, God, today I want to make this decision for you. And and look, it may hurt. It may be a super massive sacrifice for you to actually live by God's design. But his grace is enough. His grace is enough. I don't even have time to tell you. But look, when I came, I'm talking, I started to say coming back to Christ. Christ never left me. But I definitely walked away in my high school years. And I don't even have, I don't have the ability to walk through the details of the things that I had to turn from. But you know, at the end of the day, summarize it for you. You know what I turned from? Me. I turned from me. And I turned to Jesus. And there were a lot of things that Christ required me to lay down. Now, I didn't, he didn't require me to lay them down to turn to him. Repentance and confession was just like an immediate, I turned to him. But bro, the stuff of laying all this down was a process. It was me, it was me daily dying and, and, and like making commitment after commitment and messing up again and, and, and making mistake after mistake. And it was a journey of growth. It wasn't a minute. And you may say, well, I tried that. Man. You know, I, I gave God a commitment and, and you know, it, just, it lasted like a week or two. And I would say, you just got to keep walking, man. You got to keep walking. Just go the direction God's called you to go and don't quit. Don't stop. Keep being faithful in these small decisions every day that lead to a godly pattern. That's what we call discipline, spiritual discipline. It's like working out, which is, again, a foreign concept to me lately. But it's such a similar thing that, you know, you don't just go to the gym for three weeks and, and turn into like some bodybuilder. It takes time. It takes you not eating good food, (laughs) right? And it takes you like doing stuff that hurts your arms and your legs. It's not desirable. (laughs) It's not what we want to do. But oftentimes the things that are best for us are things we don't want to do. It's a discipline in our life. It's it's an area where God is, is requiring us to grow and to surrender ourselves To him. You know what it is? It's us proving that we're not just singing songs saying, You reign above them all. But it's living a life that proves we mean it. You you reign above them all. Oh, you can lift your hands to that and go right back to your sin tomorrow, baby. Oh, you reign above them all. Does he really? Does he? See, that's the question that really. We're compelled to answer. Individual commitment is a prerequisite to marriage. And so with this, this is, this is simple stuff, but I want to I just talk about Ephesians 5 for a minute. Because Ephesians 5.22 is where men oftentimes just run headlong, man. And I've had people come to me and literally say, Hey, tell her what the Bible says about submitting. You ever heard somebody do that? Well, here's the thing, you know, Ephesians 5, 22 does say wives submit, but all you have to do is like go back one verse, all right? One verse in Ephesians 5, 21, and it says that we are to submit to one another. See, guys don't really, men don't usually say, would you look at Ephesians 5, 21? Ephesians 5, 21 is a mutual submission. So God has not called us to some dictatorial, hierarchical um, uh, dominion. Men, you know what God's called you to? 
God's called you, young man who's not married yet, you know what God's called you to when you get married? God's called you to be Jesus to that woman. God's called you to be willing to die for her the way Jesus died for the church. That's heavy. That's tough. He didn't call you to be a dictator. He didn't call you to be some domineering jerk. He called you to love her, to care for her. And you may be somebody, some people be like, well, you know what? I don't need no man to care for me. I understand where you're coming from. But I would just say God, God really has said that it's a partnership where you care for each other. In the weirdest of ways, you ever, if you ever heard of five love languages, my love language is words of affirmation, which means I'm just like, I'm just super weak and I need people to say, good job, Wayne. You know, it's why preaching a message like this is really tough. And I, I'm telling you, I, t- I ask people to pray for me between services because this is probably the hardest message I've preached in eight years to you. Because I don't want you to be mad at me. But you know what? You're more important to me than that. So here's the thing. Even if you don't like what I'm saying, I love you so much that even if you get mad at me and you hate me forever, it's worth it. Because I love you too much to lie to you. And so with that, look, at the end of the day, God's created us all different. But he's created man and woman to be partners in this thing called marriage. co partners in this thing called marriage. We have different roles for sure, but neither one of us are in any way to be a dictatorial, domineering leader. Mutual surrender is required for marriage covenant. Let me just talk about covenant real quick. I've got to hurry. Covenant is not a contract. Everybody, if you've ever met with me for for, um, marriage counseling, I always talk about this because I think it's where we get it wrong most of the time. When we have contractual agreements, it's like a mutual agreement. And, and I, a party A says, I will do this as long as party B does this. I will pay, I will let you drive the car as long as you make the payment. That's what the bank says, right? I'll let you live in the house as long as you make the payment. That's a, that's a mortgage uh, contract. Contractual agreements are conditional. Like I will do A as long as you do B. Marriage is not a contract. Marriage is not a contract. If you have a contractual approach to marriage, quit. Because here's the thing. You're going to find plenty of opportunities, plenty of excuses to walk away. Your husband is going to absolutely mess up. He's not going to always get it right. Your wife is not going to always look the way she looks today. I just can't believe he said that. That really offends me right there. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I weigh 30 pounds more than I did when we got married, man. And it's not muscle. (laughs) Uh, Sometimes the things we need to hear the most are the things we like the least, right? Here's the facts, man. You're not going to always look like you look. And you might be 25, 26, about to get married. You might think, well, I'm marrying her because she's the prettiest woman. If that's the reason you're marrying, stop. Stop. It's not about a contract. Because there will be a day where if it's contractual, her conditions will change. Or your conditions will change. God forbid an accident happens and you're debilitated. And you're, you're actually like now got to be taken care of by your spouse you see that's why you say for better for worse for richer for poorer marriage is not a contract man it's a covenant it's a covenant and and the example we have of a covenant from God is that Jesus loved you when you didn't deserve it Romans 5 8 God demonstrated his love for Wayne and that while while Wayne was a worthless sinner he died for me He didn't wait for me to be good enough or good looking enough or rich enough. God loved me in spite of my imperfection and Jesus died for me. And that's the love that God calls you to have for each other. To love each other in covenant relationship. Not a relationship based on how good you feel or how much you're getting your way or how good he or she looks after 10 years. No, here's, here's the, the covenant relationship is, is geared more toward how good does God look in your marriage? You know, how, how much is he being lifted up? How much do people see him in you? Because really that's, that's the desire. We've been talking about design, 
God's desire for marriage is that people see him in you. That's simple. That, that people see him in you. You may say, well, I don't, I don't really understand how that's possible. How can people see, see God in me? Well, the, Ephesians 5 talks about, again, the picture of marriage is like Jesus and the church, husband and wife, willing to die, love, respect. It's all of this in chapter 5 of Ephesians. At the end of the day, the whole purpose for that, the whole purpose for that is so that the world would see in your marriage that God is glorified. That, that you are not basing your love for your wife or your husband on looks, on money, on, on even, how can I say it? Emotional attachment, attachment intimate attachment. All, all that stuff is stuff that God made that is wonderful and it's bonus bonuses for married couple. But listen to this. At the end of the day, is your marriage bringing honor and glory to God? You know when your marriage brings honor and glory to God is when all of that fades away and you still love that woman. When all of that's gone and the guy weighs 400 pounds, you still love him. <laughs> you still care about him. Even in his imperfections, even in his disappointments, even in her inability to be what your flesh and your weird, twisted mind longs for. You yield your desires for a God that's bigger than them. And that, that applies to all of us. Living together, same sex marriage, all of that. It's all about, is he greater than what our flesh longs for it's so difficult but listen here's the truth God has a design and a desire for you and your family we have to stop trying to redesign our lives around our own desire because his desires for us his design for us is very good we've got to stop looking out for what's good and choose what's best, what God has, has in store for us, his design and his desire. Man, here's the truth. And it's every week, man, every week. I know this is more of a controversial message and I want you to hear my heart and my love, but every week we could pull out our phone and oh, look at, they're in that sin, they're in that sin. They're all, oh, look at them. They're, they're just making a mess of their lives. I'm reaching out a hand and I'm trying to pull you out of the tracks because God's plan is better than yours. Lord, we love you. I thank you for your word. It's so good. God, I remember over two decades ago when I would have heard a message this confrontational and probably gotten really mad. So, Lord, I'm praying that you'll, you'll speak for me. That you will, through the power of your Holy Spirit, touch the hearts of men and women in this room who need to hear from you. They don't need to hear from me. God, I have nothing to say that's worth hearing. But I know this, the words that I heard you speak all those years ago changed my life. God, I've never been the same. I just, it wrecked me absolutely turned my life upside down and I'm so much better for it God you gave me something that's very good you gave me something that's very good in the place of what would have probably been an utter tragedy of my own doing and so God I pray that you would speak to our hearts and I pray that married couples would, would just really fill the altar you know, in a relationship to just want to make their marriage reflect you to people in their community and God I pray for those who may again have been gracious enough to stay in the room but disagree with what they've heard. God, would you show them your love? Not my love, it's insufficient. It's not good enough. Let them feel your grace and love even today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?